Guys, super fun new project. We're sending John and Shivala up to the North Pole to meet Santa. My name is John Adarola. I'm a host on The Young Turks, and in my life, I've never been sailing. I've never been north of Massachusetts. I don't really like the cold, and I'm scared of polar bears. I did a lot of research into bear attacks, and they are horrendous. People have died out there. Why do you think we're sending John? <laughs> but Shivala, I hope you're okay. My name is Shivala Madlena. I'm an investigative journalist. I've made documentaries for The Guardian, for Al Jazeera. I normally do current affairs stuff. I don't really get to go out in nature and I don't really get to go and see parts of the world that are remote. The polar regions are melting at an alarming rate, obviously. We talk about it on the show all the time. But I want people to get a sense of more than just headlines or statistics. Yeah. And so if we can expose the rest of the world to the people, the culture, but also the science and the nature out there, yeah. I want us to explore the Arctic in depth. I actually want to see the detail. That's always why I want to be out in the field, no matter what I'm doing, no matter what kind of story I'm working on. I want to see the actual facts on the ground. I really do care about climate change, and to be able to be amongst the scientists conducting that research on the literal frontiers of humanity in a part of the world that might be irreparably damaged in the next few decades, I think that that's worth pushing my boundaries for. I'm not going to lie. I've had nerves for a long time about this because it's not anything that I've experienced before. And so I think that going to northern Norway going up to Svalbard, a place that most people have never heard of ever, is gonna make it way more real for people. I feel like there's a whole world out there that I know very little about. I wanna see walruses. I wanna see seals. I wanna see polar bears from a very specific distance, but I still wanna see them. I'm like a warm-blooded, land-dwelling city liver. I'm interested to see how I'm gonna hold up after weeks of being up in the Arctic. It's a stamina test. It's gonna be an amazing adventure. I'm a little bit envious, but not really. But I can't wait to see it, so good luck, go get it. Over the course of this series, we'll be sharing with you true stories of the Arctic. Stories of what it is, what it was, what makes it unique, and how quickly it's changing. We'll explore its towns, meet its residents, learn about its native culture, and its local traditions. It's hard to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> we'll run with sled dogs and sail high into the Arctic Ocean. We'll follow scientists working on the cutting edge of climate change research. It's definitely changing fast. <laughs> and modern day adventurers who've made Svalbard's formidable wilderness their home. We'll get up close and personal with its rare wildlife. This one is oddly unafraid of humans. We'll journey through its past and contemplate its future. Who thought that the Arctic Ocean might be ice free in 20 years? And hopefully, by the time we are done, you'll feel like you know the true north. Welcome to Trumso, all of you. We kicked off our trip with a crash course in polar history. Tromsø is known as the gateway to the Arctic because quite a lot of the important expeditions lead from Tromsø. It's a lot of things to think about if you want to be a polar explorer. What to wear, what to eat, how to travel, how to survive in very rough conditions. In 1906, well, there's an old dog body. <laughs> He's seen some there you have the monument for those who did not return from the sea. Some years were more difficult than others. 1952 was one of the absolutely worst. 79 men died in one night. Oh my God. Traveling in the Arctic was dangerous. It could be a chance that you wouldn't come home. I feel not very prepared. <laughs> oh. So let's get geared up. You can only buy so much gear and read so much about it, and you're never going to be able to predict things. This is a large. <laughs> Does this seem large to you? <laughs> what am I most afraid of? This has got to be polar bears. It's an apex predator. It's 900 pounds or more, and increasingly hungry. That's a polar bear? That's a huge polar bear, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this used to be the old supply shop for the Arctic explorers that came around in the 1900s. Amundsen, Nansen, they all came by here, you know. Really? Got their stuff when they to went. To prep for their Yeah, 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 absolutely. We got old receipts somewhere stacked away. Wow, that's so, amazing. Yeah. Peter Nansen here is one of the most famous polar explorers. His first expedition was to try to cross Greenland with ski, and he did. He understood that if he should go for his next goal, which was the North Pole, he had much to learn about how to survive in the Arctic. 
So based on what you've learned, do you feel ready? Kind of. There's like explorers everywhere, so you feel like you're following in fairly intimidating footsteps, mm -hmm. do you think? <laughs> With like Nansen and Armitson. Yeah. Everybody has these like survival skills, and I feel woefully low on their survival skill o meter. Yeah, so. thinking ahead to camping, to being out on the boat, the possibility of storms. So this is your gentle introduction to the Arctic. For my first story, I wanted to start with the element of polar exploration that seemed the most familiar. Dogs. My name is Tore Albrechtsen. I'm an adventurer and a dog shredder. And I'm also running an outdoor company named Active Tromsø. I'm getting attacked now. <laughs> I started dog shredding when I was 12. Then I got my first dog. When I was 16, I had six dogs. Then my mother told me to quit or move. I moved, and two years later I did my first long-distance race, and since then I never looked back. When all the kids was reading cartoons, I was reading books about the polar explorers. Dog sled were really important in the history of polar exploration. The Norwegian polar explorers, and like Nansen and Amundsen, they learned to use dog sleds from the Inuit. You can bring a lot of equipment with dogs. They can eat what you hunt. They are made for traveling in snow and ice. Iditarod is the longest dog sled race in the world. It's approximately 1,100 miles. It starts in Anchorage, 22 checkpoints from start to finish. We are using approximately 9 to 11 days. This is a racing sledge. So you see there's the steering system, if you have a curve here and I'm leaning here, you know. This is a snow brake for reducing the speed. I also have a foldable mat we can slow down if I just want to smoothly brake. How much of a workout is it for you? As a musher, I have to be an active participant of my own team by helping out, kicking, pushing the sledge up together with them. How much uh, fully loaded up would this be when you're actually going on a race? It would be approximately between 50 and 70 kilo heavy. But the goal obviously is to keep it down as low as possible to yeah. make it easier for the dogs. A travel light. Speed is safety. So we talked about packing food for the race. What is that actually like? When the dogs are running, in average around 100 miles a day, they will need a lot of food, approximately between 12 and 14,000 kilocalories. Don't do that back home. <laughs> and what about for you? Well, basically everything I can. Energy bars, frozen pizzas, I just keep them. Frozen in, pizzas, in, really? Uh, you know, the small it doesn't sound that bad, know, actually. No, 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 no. <laughs> you just put them to your body. And, oh, so you just, can eat on the trail. Yeah, so, you, know, you don't stop for for, yeah. for food breaks for yourself. So when you're when you're on the race, how long are you going for? By the road are six hour run, six mm -hmm. hours break, six hours run, six hour break. Okay. And during these breaks, you have to be as efficient enough as possible. If you think you're coming into the checkpoint and you're gonna have a rest. Mm -hmm. You are wrong because that is when the, the real work starts for us. Then we have to make them rest comfortable on straw. We are going to check their feet. We are going to prepare the food. Massaging is also a part of it. So you might get one hour, one and a half hour sleep. It's an active thing being on it. You're yep. talking about 12 yep. hours over the course of a day yep. with very little yep. sleep in the middle. I'm assuming that wears you out as well as the dogs by the end of it. Oh yeah, yeah you are getting tired too. How are you actually sleeping? We don't bring tents. If you have time to put up a tent, you are wasting time you could use for sleep instead. Or you're sleeping in the straw together with the dogs. For warmth. For warmth and, yeah. and also for the dogs. Again, back to this bonding. The master is sleeping with a pack. Perfect. Wow, that is a lot of meat. And the food we are using are different kind of meat. Dried, salmon, moose, beetle dry food, all kind of delicious stuff that they love. Food is the highlight of the day. The last thing I want is to spill all over. If I get covered with meat, I'm not getting out of here alive. You crazy dogs. <laughs> That's a messy eater. How long have you been doing this? Uh, almost 40 years. 
So how many dogs would you say you've trained? Oh. oh. <laughs> I mean, we're talking uh, uh, hundreds. Starting when they're puppies, what is the initial training regimen like? Until they are around half year old, they are just puppies. They're just playing. The only training we are doing is, is a kind of a socializing, and we are bonding with them. Oh, so good. Oh, so good. Oh. So, Rocky, Hulk, Thor, and Princess Leia. <laughs> All of these things also gives me an opportunity to see about, is it any potential leaders? who is a, a problem solver. Then it's up to me as a trainer to build up the skills of actually being a, a leader later yeah. on. A lead dog is the musher's right hand. They're going in front, they're keeping the line straight. We need to communicate. They trust you and we trust them. This is Anvik, our grand old lady. She's the oldest dog we have on the kennel. She's 13 years old. She's a lead dog. And now she's filling a very important function for me by being my good assistant when I'm training up the young puppies. The dogs who are going close to the sledge, we call them wheel dogs. Frost, he is a wheel dog. And they are the engine in the team. Mm. They need to be mental quite strong because they have the sledge just right yeah. behind the tail. They really have to trust me as a driver. I'm not driving over them. Hey, Olaf. In what position is Olaf? He's also a team dog. Okay. You know, young dogs, you are starting kindly with them. Start in the bulk of the team and yeah, get experience. Yeah. They can't do much wrong there. How long does it take to train up a dog to be on that A-team? When you start training of, of the dogs in the, in the autumn, you know, we are starting careful, and then we are increasing every single week, because then their muscles and body are, are ready for the long distances. And what total distance are you aiming for in these races? Before I start I did the road, for example, I probably have around three and a half, four thousand miles training. <laughs> People are asking about, isn't the dogs getting bored about doing the same round again and again? No, they don't. The willingness of working, you know, the passion the dogs are showing, craziness and jumping and screaming and really want to go. Uh, I used to say to people, if you have the same kind of passion to your work as these dogs have, you're doing a hell of a good job. Okay, we are going dog cart training. You're gonna have 10 eager dogs in front. And you said this is their first time out. This is so the far first the tour for the season. So they're like desperate to get going. They are crazy. Let's get some dogs. Oh, oh, oh. It's amazing how the dogs just get on their sides of the line. I mean, they're obviously crazy, but they're ready to go. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> this is amazing. The dogs are like, it's summer. We're going in every one of these puppies. <laughs> I don't care what you say, human. <laughs> when you turn back here, they know to shift the entire line over. It's amazing. <laughs> mush! Mush doggos! And they're like, well, we know what we're doing, buddy. This is our first time at the rodeo. Good job, dogs. to be in the lead. <laughs> uh, briefly in the lead? Feels pretty good. Come on, bubbles. Right up. Up. No. No! We want that title. <laughs> we should call this episode the Fast and the Furious. So if you were wondering, do you stop to let the dogs poop? Uh, the answer is you do not stop, but they do poop. <laughs> Constantly. I've got to pass you, pups. Better move. Jeep. Jeep. Hurry up! Hey! <laughs> well, my dreams of beating him back to the, to the finish line, I don't think that's actually going to happen. That was pretty awesome. so hard.
You worked so hard. When I got Merlin and he was a puppy, he used to sleep in the bed with us. <laughs> and then Tura asked, when he's bigger, where is he gonna sleep then? And then I think I just simply replied, the real question is where are you gonna sleep? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is a few things I can't say no to. Oh my <laughs> <laughs> when you have been spending a lot of time training them up, the race is just a sand. You want them to come through that with a good result and happy dose and bring them home and, and say this was a good experience. Don't chew on my fingers now. <laughs> Dog sledding was honestly a dream come true. Working alongside a dog to accomplish something, helping them out, like digging my feet into the mud and then going down the hills and seeing how excited they were. That was great because it wasn't just something that I was experiencing, I was experiencing it alongside a group of really awesome animals. It was an amazing way to start my journey. Doing a long expedition means you are making a kind of a contract with your dogs. It's important to take care of your team. You have the best friends with you. We headed to Svalbard, an island 650 miles from the North Pole and the northernmost year-round settlement on Earth. The island has only a handful of towns, all originated by mining companies, and just 3,000 residents, so the polar bears outnumber the people. Most of these people live in Longyearbyen, Svalbard's largest city. My name is Ronny Blumvall. I work for Visit Svalbard, which is a tourism management organization. It's like living in a normal society, but in the same time, it's very different because we have the wilderness outdoors with polar bears and the total darkness or the northern lights or the midnight sun or all these extremities of the high Arctic. It used to be a place for Norwegians to come and work in the mine and earn a lot of money. Now there's also scientific stations, the university center, and tourism, which also creates a special type of people coming up there to live the Arctic more than to live of the Arctic. Tourism here is growing quickly and centers around nature, adventure and history. My name is Trina. I study anthropology and I first came up here doing field work. I've been guiding the last two summers. I guess most of the people coming to Longyearbyen are adventurous people. It's not for everybody. It's quite extreme at some points. Outside the settlement, cell phones don't work, and you're required by law to carry a gun for polar bear protection. So we're off in the extremely windy outskirts of Longyearbyen, and we're heading up into the hills looking for fossils. So fingers crossed, or at least attempted cross. These two glaciers that were on both sides of the mountain used to go all the way down to the city. Really? Yeah. How long ago? Uh, I think it was in the 70s. Was there a lot of seasonal variation or is it like just now a permanent change? It's been retrieving for quite a long time now. It's just steadily. And it's still retrieving, it's still going back. But it's hard to say if it's this much because of human activity. And as it's going back in regression, it will reveal a lot of fossils. It's weird to imagine that where we're standing right now used to be ice taller than our head that might have lasted for, you know, God knows how long stretching back through human history. <laughs> Note the warning. <laughs> it's gonna be a bit steep and a bit slippery. Watch out where you walk. The fossils we're finding today are about 60 to 90 million years old. So there's quite a lot over here. To have coal and coal mines, you have to have a forest at one point that got very much compressed. There's a pretty big, complete leaf here. Oh, wow. Svalbard used to be a tropical forest. <laughs> It, uh, it was once below equator a very, very long time ago and it's been moving further and further north. And now uh, when it was 80 degrees north, uh, it started losing its leaves. See on this little one, you can see a pretty good outline of a tiny little leaf there. Tens of millions of years old. So right now we're looking for fossils and we've actually found a few, but what we're finding far more of, if you look, 
is actually just freestanding coal. You don't even need to dig. I mean, we're surrounded by coal mines, but it's interesting that you can just find lumps of coal laying on the ground. So in the years you've lived in this area, how much polar bear activity has there been? One or two times every year. Did they make it down into the actual town? In January, we had a, a mother and two cubs going through town. They had to chase it away. Mm -hmm. And they had to do it for three days <laughs> because it kept coming back. Oh, it kept coming back. <laughs> didn't want to go. The most important thing you bring outdoors is the knowledge on avoiding trouble with the polar bears. Like if we saw a polar bear now, depending on how far away it would be, the first thing I would do would be gather the group. Then we would start leaving as fast as possible. If it was coming after us, I would start leaving clothes because that might distract the polar bear. <laughs> Everybody <Yeah>. strapped. <laughs> then if it kept coming closer, I would start with the flare gun and I would shoot it in a way so it would land between me and the polar bear. You have a flare gun on you? Yeah, it's in my back. Yeah. And then if that doesn't work, I have to set a line because a polar bear can run like 40 kilometers per hour. So you set a distance where you're like, okay, if it comes to here, I'm shooting because it's about your safety as well. But shooting a polar bear isn't just uncommon, it's illegal. It's considered murder. You like, can't stand your ground? <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time you're gonna get a fine because there's always gonna be something you could have done to avoid shooting it. We are guests in the realm of the polar bears, so we need to respect that. But nature, wildlife, and adventure are only part of the picture. What do you see there? That's an entrance to a mine. In Svalbard, everything comes back to the mines. We have seven mines in this city. 1A is also called the American Mine. In 1906, uh, John Munro Longyear started the first mine. Ten years after, in uh, 1916, he sold it to Stornoska, the big Norwegian coal company. It's still a mining town. There is an active mine, mine number seven, where they produce coal for the local power plant. Until like 1990 or something, it was a total company town. In fact, until 1980, the only currency accepted were tokens distributed by Stor Norsk, who owned every building, residence, store, and utility. And as they open new mines in the early days, they used to just move the town from one place to the next place. It looks like they just dropped something here and dropped something there. I think it was never meant to last. There could be a lot of studies being done up here in anthropology. And with this big change with stopping the mining and what people will do now. Last year we had the one mine in Svea closing down. That meant that some people had to move away from here because they couldn't stay here without the job. We wanted to find out what life was like for Longyearbyen citizens in the not-so-distant past. So we headed to mine number three, which shut down in 1996 after years of dwindling profits and a series of tragic accidents. Welcome to uh, mine number three. My name is Runa. The mines that are running today are a very modern sort of coal mines. But mine number three was the last low drifted mine. So that meant that for the people working here, they had to crawl on their hands and knees all day long for their eight hour shifts. And when you're in through the permafrost layer, it could get so cold when you were laying down flat in these tunnels that uh, you actually had to find the most difficult position to dig in to get some extra heat. Everybody was connected to their own ID number. So when you were ending your shift, you had to return it. They would hang it on the board and count. So if it turned out that the tag was missing, they would of course stop production and start to look for you. And stopping production would uh, cost uh, time and money. So if uh, you were a person that forgot this a lot, then you would end up being fired. I know it's just a model, but it is crazy to think, as she said, they just shut it down. Like, this is exactly what it actually looked like. Like, 50 people every eight hours coming in here for years, for decades, getting ready for toil beyond anything I've ever experienced in my life. And we get to recreate it, but they actually lived it. This is called the lamp room because this is where they have the charging stations for the headlamps. So this was then worn on this equipment belt where you had your uh, number tag, you had this filter mask and you had then this battery. And this was more like a car battery. So you can feel yourself how much it weighs. Oh yeah, that's just another thing as you're trying to crawl around. Mining's good for the obliques. Yes. <sighs> So then they took uh, place in these wagons. 
this locomotive that you see, of course it didn't come in this color from the factory. In late 70s, the coal company allowed women to start working as miners. Guys working here worried that the women wouldn't stay. And it was not because it was hard physical labor. The reason they thought they would quit was that it was so depressing. So they thought that uh, a little bit of bright colors would help them. Is that why we have the uh, purple cabinets? Yeah. It's like when you frantically clean your apartment before a girl comes over. Just want to make it presentable. <laughs> it's nice. You really see how much they left behind when they shut it down in 1996. Tools just stuck in the ground. It's like observing the after effects of Pompeii. What you see here is a jack. And these were used to hold up the ceiling in the small narrow tones they were taking out the coal. The workers on the jack shift, and that was both men and women, and they were able to lift these using just one arm <laughs> on their backs or on their sides oh or sitting on their knees. Let's try. It's 18 kilos. The people working on the jack shift were not the people you wanted to do arm wrestling with. That would be a very bad idea. <laughs> the only thing that was holding this one up was this pin here. So if you had then accidents, it would have a massive effect on the other ones and you can have huge collapses. And it did actually happen. They had two fatal accidents with these friction jacks. So in 1991, they started uh, using hydraulic ones instead. And uh, then it was a lot of uh, angry people on the jack shift because those were a lot heavier. So it's twice the weight of the friction one, 36. Yeah, it's significantly yeah. heavier. <laughs> Definitely not while laying down. <sighs> you can't see, but on the inside of my suit, there's blood running down it. <laughs> Here, we have a cutting machine. They laid that then on the ground in the tunnel, and this blade was cutting the lower part of the coal seam. They would then make holes with a drill on top of the coal seam. It's so long, it actually has to hold around the drill while it's going. Oh. And inside these holes, they would put sticks of dynamite and then blow it up. Then it was time for the next shift, and their assignment was to uh, push this coal out of the tunnel and into the wagons. And those 10 people managed to take out 300 tons of coal each 24 hours. God, if the zombie apocalypse comes, that's what you want on the front of your vehicle. Imagine the work that it must take over years to dig further and further into this. I mean, this is solid stone and it goes on for kilometers. So here is a um, model tunnel. I notice they're not using the hydraulic ones in this. No, this is the old, uh, old version. <laughs> I like electricity and everything, but this seems like a lot of trouble to go to, just to create power. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Ah. Damn it. <laughs> oh, okay. It's not as tall as I thought it was in Prague. <laughs> Whoops. Low bridge. Oh. Okay, this is this is definitely good for the neck. Now, imagine the only thing stopping this mountain from crashing back down on you is these little things. This piece of metal is all you've got holding everything out. This girder could slip. Any of this, you're, you've got this gigantic industrial chainsaw that you're hoping won't cut through this and send the whole thing crumbling down. Wow. And it, it's, it's getting low, I'm not gonna lie, and one of these girders is very bent. That's reassuring. You certainly get a feel for what it was like down here. But then you start to think about the people who eight hours a day or more for months and for years of their life, this was their experience. Breathing in the coal fumes, trusting to these devices to save your life, and in many cases, of course, lives were lost in tragedies that are difficult to imagine now. And this is just a taste. I don't know if it came from higher up in the company, the doctors, but they said that the coal dust, it wasn't dangerous for you because coal is carbon and you're made of carbon. <laughs> so it's, it's all good. But the coal dust is actually quite big particles and, and pointy and sharp. So it actually makes a lot of scars in your lungs. So it caused respiration problems, emphysema. And if you would ignite that, it would 
turn explosive. In 1984, they did have an accident in this area with some flame igniting all of the coal dust. Before we then turn and walk back, I would like to show you how dark it is here. So if we all turn off the headlamps at the same time, you will see how it really can be inside a coal mine. Wow. Yeah. There's nothing. Imagine getting lost in here. Exactly. In the dark. Oh my God. It wasn't just the explorers that had a hard time. The, the regular families and the workers who would go up to Svalbard had a very difficult life. And when you look at the history of mining there, all of the loss of life from explosions and cave-ins, and those were not exceptions to the rule. Those were the realities of living there for decades and decades, up until very recently. And uh, going down in the mine, that was a sobering experience. Now, as coal mining is obviously on its way out, everybody points at tourism for being sort of the new big industry on Svalbard. We need to create more jobs. And of course, that might create pressure on nature, pressure on the local society. Now we have to create systems for not becoming a place of mass tourism. to Pyramiden. It's an abandoned ghost town. It was this big modern Soviet mining settlement right up near the North Pole. And we're just passing some of the most beautiful mountains and these huge colonies of birds and puffins. Oh, yeah, there it is. Whoa. Very big Oh my God. This is the first glacier I've ever seen. And it looks like it's made by wizards. Well, we've just pulled up to Pyramid in the Russian settlement, and you can already see all these disused Soviet buildings that are just crumbling. This is the Hotel Pyramid in. This is where I'm staying at tonight. And once I'm in the hotel, I can't leave without an armed escort because of polar bears. And so this is why I have Renee here. It's gonna keep him away. Yeah, I mean, at least I'm gonna try, you know, not making any promises. <laughs> When was the last time we heard about polar bears in the area? Earlier today, there's one just across the fjord here. So it's in the vicinity, it could easily walk here. Do they try and break into things? And we have that quite often. They break into buildings and yeah, try to eat food. There can't be any food left in this town. Oh, you'll be surprised how many like old rations and stuff that they find stored away. Yeah. And the thing is, we don't find them, but the polar bears, they smell them. This place feels like it's where animals live now, and we're just kind of visiting really taking over the place. So this whole town is owned by Arctikul? Trust Arctikul. That's the mining company, no? Yeah, and it's a government-owned company, Russian government. And it used to be the communist Russian government. So it was founded in 1932. So my name is Sarah Victoria, and I'm a local guide in Pyramider ghost town. Nowadays, Sarah, so here in Pyramider, we have only 10 people who live permanently here. We run the hotel and run the restaurant. Only three of us stay here for the whole year round. This is a complex town with infrastructure and walkways and power. I mean, they put a lot of time and effort A lot money. of money and a lot of time into this, yeah. And again, it was for many reasons. One of them was to prove for the Western world that communism works. And it really did work here. Communism rule was kept in Svalbard yeah. in, in the Russian settlements yeah. until 98, until it actually closed down. Right. Even though communism fell in 91. Yeah. The, the miners would go to the mine, they had very short days. Yep. And then they would come back home. They would go to the cafeteria, they could eat all they want, they could drink all they want, even the alcohol was free, it was all paid for by the Russian government. Yeah, and everything go, was go. taken care of. Exactly. Yeah, back in the day, there was, there was a lot higher standard living here than in the filthy town of Longyearbyen. <laughs> Longyearbyen was like a, like a company town, and this was also a company town, but they had a lot more going for them. They had really nice facilities, so here in Pyramid, for such a small community with 800 people, all those people remember this place like your dream place, sir, because that was the only place in the world where communism has actually been built, because everything was for free here. 
So that was really good opportunity for them to work a lot and to save a lot. So like they had their own self-sufficient yeah, system? Exactly. They were quite self-sufficient. Longyearbyen has never been self-sufficient actually. They had farms, they had cows, they had all the stuff they needed, even at greenhouses. It really worked up here. Then, in 1996, tragedy struck the tiny Arctic town, bringing it all to an end. It really is strange. It looks like a museum. People up and left in two weeks. That's why you get this kind of Chernobyl feeling from it. In August of 1996, sir, we had the plane from Moscow crash near Longyearbyen. All 141 people on board died. That was a really hard experience here for such a small community where everybody knows each other. That was one of the reasons why they decided to close down Pyramiden settlement. It wasn't their only reason why they decided to close down. Yeah, because in the 90s it was really dark times for Russia. We had really deep economical and political crisis and there we just had no money to maintain all these mining settlements on the island. Special is the right word to describe it. It's really different from what we usually have in the mainland. It's such an isolated place where you have no phone coverage, no internet access, no Wi-Fi, no TV, nothing really. Did they bring all this wood in? Yeah, all this is imported from Russia. We've been trees here for about six million years. In its heyday, it must have been this incredible feat of engineering. This is where you walk up to the mine. Oh, wow. It's this network that seems to go everywhere. Where does it feed into? There are tunnels. It used to be able to pretty much connect the whole city. Yeah. So you could always walk dry and warm. It kept the motivation high, and especially in the dark season. Yeah, everything was very carefully planned. And now it's a bird sanctuary. It's not that long ago, if you think about it. It's incredible how fast nature can take over. Lots of things were stolen and destroyed for this period of abandon. There's been a lot of ermites, like lonely people living here through the years. Really? Yeah, a friend of mine named Vladimir. He was just Stop here living that. alone with one of these arctic foxes, this is Pat. So he was here for about three and a half but years. But how would he live? I think he just chose a building, kind of settled in. Yeah. And then there was this German guy living here for a couple of years, but apparently he went crazy. He was like running down to the docks, chasing people with axes and stuff. Yeah, and now he's actually the head mechanic in town now. <laughs> I'm not joking, yeah. Great. I feel like I'm having an acid trip. This place is kind of reminding me of the Hotel in the Shining. Come join us. There's a colony of kittiwakes in an abandoned building opposite your window. They're pretty amazing. You can watch them for a while, especially since there's no internet here. So watching the birds is how you get to sleep. Nowadays we are doing some restoration works here, but there, actually we try to keep this settlement as it was 20 years ago. So like back in the day with this whole area, is this like the downtown, I guess? Yeah, it was. This is Main Street. Yeah, it's really impressive actually. People who worked and lived here, they were really good professionals in the mining industry and they just come in here for two years contract. They were welcome to bring their families with them, their children, so they had all facilities for them here in the settlement. In almost every city in Russia, you can see in the center of the settlement our statue of Lenin, our grandpa, mm. our revolution leader, our comrade, <laughs> Tavarish Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. He's still watching for the great future. Anita. <laughs> Here. Sir, you're welcome. 
So what was this place used for? The city hall was like kind of culture center and sports center in one. Yeah. So they had really nice facilities for those people who worked and lived here because everybody should do something besides work. <laughs> it's quite eerie. <laughs> And now you can come here every day if you want on the boat, but back then you were pretty cut off. Oh yeah, during winter season they couldn't receive any birds. So they have to get stuck here in Pyramida through the whole winter. So they had to entertain themselves. And social life is really important because everybody should feel like a part of the society. They're not alone here. So far to not so far from the mainland. I like this. <laughs> Just find random props from whatever the last performance was. Oh, there's costumes. We're gonna play. Yeah. Even for a small town, this would be a big haul. Yes, our government put yeah, so much attention to make this place nicer. Because uh, it was really like a showcase to Western countries how nice it was to live in a socialist community. And they also had some kind of like culture exchange programs here. So it was like a little gateway of exchange up at yeah, the North Pole. Yeah. Oh, wow. All the teams would play here. Oh, yeah. Adults, children. Football and volleyball. Oh, they would have tournaments with the yeah, people yeah, over yeah, at Bernsburg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a gym in the back. All the stuff is handmade here, so you can see these yeah, really brutal things. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if after shift mining I would want to come back and pump <laughs> iron. That was the northernmost swimming pool in the world. I assume it was heated. No, it was heated. It yeah. was heated, yeah. So you can look at a glacier out there in the window and be in a nice heated pool. It's very luxurious, actually. It's interesting they built the pool upstairs. You can't dig it down because the permafrost will destroy it. It's the same reason we can't bury anyone up here, right? Because if you put them in the ground, uh, the body will surface within a few years. This is my favorite room so far. There's an old paper here from Russia, and it has a picture of Gerard Depardieu on it. I don't know why. I mean, the place has been abandoned for like 10 years after the mine shut down. Even 15, yeah. So why do people start coming back? Just for the tourism or? So yeah, our coal mining company is trying to find a way how to diversify economy here. So they are trying to make some profit from any other industry because the coal mining is not profitable at all. Yeah, mm -hmm. so they have to to find some money for to maintain all these mining settlements on the island. I mean, why are they interested in even maintaining this place? It's according to the Svalbard Treaty, if they yeah. don't do business on the land, the Norwegian government can take it back. When were the, the last children to actually go to school? So they decided to close down the mine in their, the start of 1998. And their last year in the school was like in 1994. Yeah, so after that, all the children were evacuated from here. So to the right, we have like a like high school and to the left, that was a nursery school, like kindergarten and so on. Mine is step here. Oh, wow. That was like the place where yeah, they're doing some lessons. It's actually beautiful, like the colors and everything. You don't you oh, yeah? see places like this. Yeah, this looks like a movie set. Amazing artwork. Oh, yeah. <laughs> some sort of insane Bugs Bunny. This is cute. You can still see the stuff the kids made. <laughs> I like this scene this kid's drawing. <laughs> Oh yeah, also with Germans, so you can see these signs. There's a shark eating a leg. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, kids are violent everywhere and every time. <laughs> what I love is that there's like Disney paintings on here. Disney cartoons were really popular. There's like a weird, bald, goofy. <laughs> there's the referee. <laughs> It's kind of nuts to see like a little glimpse into a Soviet classroom. So this is obviously where they had nap time. You can see there's like little shoes left. It's really special that everything just stay around here for ages, for decades, for centuries. 
and you're just a small man in the center of this place. This way. Is this the glacier that you can see from Pyramiden? Here, it's melted a lot since those times. Exploring Pyramidum was a really unique kind of window into what was like this thriving socialist community in the middle of the Arctic. The traces of how they lived there and the history that it shows, it's almost like a living museum. And I'm so glad I came here. Arr, you're just crazy. That's why you're behind bars. You can't be trusted out here. You go wild. Look at you. You can't even keep it together right now. Ha ha ha!